Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We are preaching through the book of Genesis, looking at the roots of the gospel and learning stuff about the roots of the Jewish nation, people who were blessed by the covenant God made with Abraham. All right, Genesis 46, here it is dramatized. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night. Jacob, Jacob, here I am. I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob their little ones and their wives in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and went to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons, who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanok, Palu, Hezran, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jimuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Mirerai. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezran and Hamul. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimran. The sons of Zebulun were Sered, Elan, and Jalil. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, with his daughter Dinah. All the persons, his sons and his daughters, were thirty-three. The sons of Gad were Ziphian, Haggai, Shunai, Ezban, Erai, Arodai, and Arilai. The sons of Asher were Jimna, Ishua, Isuai, Bariah, and Sira, their sister. And the sons of Bariah were Heba and Malkiel. These were the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, but Joseph and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of An, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, Bikur, Ashbel, Gira, Naaman, Ehi, Rash, Mapim, Hapim, and Ad. These were the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, fourteen persons in all. The son of Dan was Hushim. The sons of Naphtali were Jazael, Gunai, Jeza, and Shilam. These were the sons of Bila, whom Laban gave to Rachel his daughter. And she bore these to Jacob, seven persons in all. 
all the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's sons' wives, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were seventy. Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, because you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me, and the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock, and they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? that you shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. For those of you who are with us for the first time, we've been looking at the gospel through the story of God's people in the book of Genesis. After Christ arose from the dead while he was proving himself alive to his followers before ascending to the Father, he, for 40 days, showed himself to them. And on one of those occasions, two disciples were walking to Emmaus. He came up to them and said, what are you guys talking about? Of course, they were talking about his resurrection. And the scriptures say that he opened his mouth and from Moses and the prophets, he preached things concerning the Christ or the Messiah. Then their eyes were opened, they realized it was him, and he went someplace else. So Jesus preached the gospel from Genesis. The early church did not have the New Testament. They had the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the rest of the Old Testament, or we call the First Testament, or the Tanakh, the covenant scriptures, beginning with the writings of Moses. So we have the gospel in this amazing story. So in this story, a man named Jacob had 12 sons, 10 of whom hated son number 11 and sold him into slavery. He winds up in Egypt and through a series of events, after being in prison and enslaved for 13 years, he becomes like the prime minister of Egypt. And for seven years, Egypt experiences a glorious time a bountiful harvest. And through his leadership, they were preparing during that time for a famine that would be seven years long that was revealed to Pharaoh that would come their way. So two years into the famine, this is 22 years after his brothers sold him into slavery, here come his brothers needing food. And he said, if you come back, you got to bring your little brother with you. He was testing them. He didn't reveal himself to them that he was even uh, their brother. He spoke to them through an interpreter. He looked like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. He had a wife that was Egyptian. So they went back home when they ran out of food. They persuaded their father to let him bring their little brother. Uh, Joseph had been his favorite son. Now the little brother was his favorite son. And they didn't dare harm him. They brought him back. And so he framed, Joseph framed his little brother so that he would have cause to imprison him, just to see how the big brothers were. And man, they were not excited. When the framing was exposed on their road back home, they all went back into Egypt with the little brother to defend him. And one of the brothers, Judah, put his life on the line and says, imprison me instead of him. My father will die if anything happens to our little brother, whose name was Benjamin. Joseph broke, revealed himself to who he was, to his brothers, and there's a glorious reunion. 
They go back home and get their dad. Pharaoh sends wagons with them, probably chariots, to haul the old man and his family back. On the way from Hebron, they stop in Beersheba, where his father and his grandfather, Abraham and Isaac, had lived and had met with God. And there he had an encounter with God that we'll go to in a minute. First of all, I just want to look at the genealogies. I'm not going to preach them, but we see that it is said to be 66 persons. But if you do the math, there's 70 names of males. Two girls are named in the genealogy. So so what kind of math is this? Well, you count living males as your, your heritage, and the males are the ones who get the inheritance, and the wives are protected by the inheritance of the males. Uh, Dinah is mentioned because of a great injustice that had happened to her. We don't know that she ever married. So there's 70 people listed, two of whom are dead, Aaron Onan, Judah's first two sons, Uh, God took them out because of their wickedness. So it's really 68 people. But when it gives the count in verse 26, all the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's son's wives, just the blood relatives are counted. So the sons and their sons are in this list. He says it's 66 persons in all. Well, If 66 people went with him to Egypt, it wouldn't be including Joseph and his two sons. So that would create 67, right? So how is it 66? Well, you also cannot include Er and Onan because they're dead. So take away two more, it actually makes 65. How can it be 66 and not 65? Somebody's got to have had a baby. One of the sisters listed is Sarah, another sister is Dinah, and then there's other multiple daughters. And, of course, all those sons-in-law. So somebody's got to have had a baby on the way. (laughs) How in the world did Jacob keep track of all those birthday (laughs) parties? Tough deal. So 66 persons, if you count the baby, and take away Joseph and his two sons and the two sons that died. All right, then verse 27 is another mathematical puzzle. The sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. So that's three, that's true. So put them with the 69, the 66, with the baby. How does it arrive at 70? Because it should be 69. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. Well, you've got to count Jacob. We didn't count Jacob in verse 26 because it said all the persons who went with Jacob, right? But verse 27, it says all the persons of the house of Jacob. Jacob's of his own house, right? So the house of Jacob surely includes Jacob. So you get 70 people. What's the significance of that? Well, here God is creating a new race of people. And after the great flood earlier in this book, there's another genealogy that lists 70 nations. So here's a new nation. We could say 71 or 72 if you count the Ishmaelites. A new nation being formed with 70 forefathers. Isn't that awesome? It's interesting that Jesus raised up 12 apostles, one of whom was a great disappointment. Anybody got a child named Judas? No. He sent out 70 disciples to preach the gospel. So the number 70 is significant. And um, they go on into land. So this could have been 300, 500 people. This is quite an entourage, counting the in-laws and the outlaws. Everybody. And they go to the land of Goshen. Now, Goshen is prime real estate. We'll talk about that in a minute. So going back to Beersheba... When God appeared and visited with Jacob, he spoke these words to him, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. Now, his father Isaac had been told not to go to Egypt. His grandfather Abraham had went to Egypt without being told to go, and it really wasn't a good thing. That's where Hagar came from. 
And that's where Abraham lied and caused a little chaos there. But here he's being told, don't be afraid to go to Egypt. I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. What does that mean? It means when you die, Joseph's going to be the one that closes your eyes. He's going to be with you when you die. You're never going to be separated from him again. I was present in the room where my dad died. People left the room, and I was there with him alone. His corpse, his body, he wasn't there. And his eyes were open, just staring at the wall, and that bothered me. And I thought, I wonder if they'll stay shut if I try. I didn't know it was a thing. And I touched him and tried, and they stayed shut. So I put my hand on my dad's eyes. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject, where God guides, he provides. Can we say that? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that you'd speak to us in such a way that we would remember that if you're guiding us, you're going to provide for the mission to which you've called us. In Jesus' name, amen. When God calls you to do something, you may not have the balance in the checking account required to go for it. Now, some people foolishly use their borrowing power to go and do what they feel God told them to do, and, and then they felt like God was obligated to, to pay the bill when he hadn't told them in the first place. So you really got to know God has spoken to you, and when you do know, step out in faith and obey him. Can I get an amen? amen? He told Jacob, I am God, the God of your father. I'm the God of Isaac. I took care of him. I'm going to take care of you. God has no grandchildren. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Joseph. He's the God of your dad and my dad. He's the God of you, and he's the God of your children. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean your children are, are Christians. They have to have their own walk with God. Amen? And if you're part of a denomination, they may choose to leave that denomination. But your concern shouldn't be your worth in the eyes of your brothers and sisters in your denomination. Your concern should be your walk with God. I am the God, the God of your father, and I'm your God too, is what he's implying. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. I'm telling you to go. Don't be afraid. I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. I'm not sending you there by yourself. I'm going to be with you. I will surely bring you up again. His bones are going to come up. He's going to die there, and he's, but he's going to go back. His family is going to bury him back in his homeland. But yet he is going to go back again in his people. Because the nation is called Israel, which is the name God had given him. And Joseph will be with you when you die. What is this saying? I'm guiding you to do something you wouldn't do on your own. And I am going to provide for you to do it. This promise was confirmed in the next chapter. Let's, let's read it. Just six verses. He, you know, he has a glorious reunion with his son Joseph. Gets to see him after 23 plus years. And Joseph is excited about his dad being here. And so he goes and tells Pharaoh and says to Pharaoh, my father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds, and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? Now, if you look at the previous chapter, verse 33, he told his brothers, when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say your servants occupation has been with livestock from our youth until now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. I think they worship sheep, something like that. This would kind of be like uh, going to India to open a cattle ranch or a slaughterhouse. 
<laughs> so don't, you know, don't focus on being shepherds. Tell them you take care, you know, you're cowboys, cattlemen. Speaking of sheep being an abomination, there was, there was some cattle and sheep wars back in the Wild West, I understand. Cattlemen hated sheep farmers, sheep ranchers, because sheep, when they eat, they don't just eat the grass and move on. They eat the grass and pull up the roots and eat that too, so it's hard for the grass to grow back. Goats kind of are the same way. They'll leave behind a nice field, nothing but rocks. <laughs> if you want to expose the rocks in your land, just get some goats. They'll, they'll help you do it. So did his brothers abide by it? Look at this. Pharaoh said to his brothers, verse 3 of 47, what is your occupation? And they said, we're cattle ranchers. No, they didn't. They said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds. <laughs> Kin folks, what are you going to do with them? Well, it didn't backfire. Joseph was, maybe that was some deception, I don't know, but they were honest with him. They said, we are, and also our fathers, they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Now, they had never been all over Egypt. They probably didn't know that Goshen was the best place to live in all of Egypt. It's the Nile Delta. If you're going to live somewhere during a famine, go to the mouth of the Mississippi. <laughs> the Mississippi Delta. Not only is the food good and the music good, but there's some moisture in the land. Pharaoh spoke to Joseph saying, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Look at this. The land of Egypt is before you. Make your father and your brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. If you know any able men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. So not only do they get to live in the blessed place, but they get a job. Now this job is going to grow because through Joseph's involvement with the government and them running out of money, we'll see in the next chapter, Pharaoh winds up the owner of all the livestock in the land. So these boys are going to prosper and they are going to be busy. The land of Goshen, the mouth of the Nile River. The Nile River runs south to north through Africa and it is a mighty river, and Goshen is a wonderful place. You have heard of it on the Pillow Man's commercial. Watch this. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Giza dreams are made with the finest, most sought after cotton in the world. Giza cotton was once reserved for only the finest dress shirts, but is now available in Mike's Giza Dream Sheets. They feature a beautiful silky sateen weave that helps keep you cool and comfortable all night long. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world is I'm not selling pillows. <laughs> but that's the part of the world. The world recognizes it every day if you watch some news programs. Where God guides, he provides. Now, is this, is this one of those pithy quotes, one of those bumper sticker things, you know? I did a series years ago called Mantras. And it was on these things people say, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And um, the Bible didn't say that. What's true in that saying and what's not true? Like, let your conscience be your guide. The Bible doesn't say that. The Quran does. You don't want to let your conscience be your guide. You want to train your conscience, and it will help you follow the way in which you've trained it. A Muslim feels guilty. His conscience bothers him if he doesn't pray so many times a day. Why? His conscience have been, has been trained. So you don't want to let your conscience be your guide, but you want to train your conscience. 
Another one, people say, follow your heart. You do not want to follow your heart. You want to guard your heart. If you follow your heart, live in the now, and just live by your feelings, it's going to take you to a world of disappointment. Well, I thought. These sayings we say, so is where God guides, he will provide. Is this one of those? I don't think so. I don't think so. From what I see in the Word and even by experience. From kindergarten through the third grade, my family lived in this three-room house. It had a back porch. They enclosed, so you could technically say four rooms, but nobody stayed back there. That's where they put the chemical toilet when it was too cold to use the outhouse. We bathed in the kitchen sink. When we got too big to be in the sink, we stood beside the sink and bathed. My parents slept on a fold-out couch bed, and the kids were in the third room. All four of us were in there. That's where we lived while my dad built a church. The church had toilets. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was awesome. After they got the church built, they added a bedroom that had a restroom. I do not recall using that restroom. I don't know if I did or not. I do recall some members of the church quitting because they thought the church didn't need to build that. My parents went to meet the members to try to talk them into coming back. They met them. I remember this vividly. They met them at a construction site where they were having a house built with three restrooms. Anyway, little church politics there. So in 1965, we left that house, moved to Fossima, Liberia, 65 miles from the nearest motor road, to live on a mission base for one year. In the deep jungle was a base established by missionaries years earlier. Guess what? The house had a toilet, had a bathtub, and in the evening when we lit a fire, it had hot water. So God guided us and in his guiding, there was provision better than what we had at home. Where God guides, he provides. We're in a room full of people. If you live for God long at all, you probably could testify of the Lord leading you somewhere that looked like, man, it's going to be really tough. And yet the Lord provided and met your needs. Years later, as newlyweds with a baby while in college, my pastor offered me a job for half what I was making. I worked for Kingwood Signs. I loved that job to work for him as assistant pastor. It was really a glorified janitor. 25 acres that needed to be mowed, a 32-space trailer park that if you didn't mow your grass and you lived there, guess who got to mow it? I was in the best shape of my life the years I worked there. The Lord provided for us. The four and a half years I worked there, I can testify. God guided us. It wasn't through my zeal that came to me and says, I think we're supposed to do it. We had a guest speaker preach on the subject of faith, and she came up afterwards and grabbed my hand and said, Alan, you're supposed to do it. God's going to provide. And he did. It's just amazing. So God provides. If it's his will, it's his will. Amen. God himself is our source. He is our source. Isaiah 58, 11 is the verse people use when they say, where God guides, he provides. It says, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. You will be taken care of. By God's guiding. He will guide you to provision. Getting ahead of myself. So God himself is our source. What he provides is our resource. Our resource is not our source. Our job is not our source. God is our source. Right? He uses jobs to provide resources. But God supreme is our source. So don't accept things as they are if there's not enough to go around. Ask God, who's a source of wisdom and provision, to provide the wisdom you need 
to survive and thrive and succeed, as well as to provide other streams of income or a whole, whole different, different scenario. He is our source. Philippians, Paul wrote this, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God will supply all your needs, not according to our lack, but according to his riches in glory. How many riches are there in glory? What's the dimensions of heaven? So many miles by so many miles by so many miles? Some huge amount of cubic miles of gold, pearls, jewels, diamonds. So he meets our needs. Some people don't present their little problems to God because they don't want to bother him. I heard a uh, comedian making fun of Protestants. So they said, you know, they just bother Jesus with everything, with their flat tire and with their this and with their that. When, when there are lower level gods or saints that you can go to with those little things, don't be bothering Jesus. Trust me, you don't bother the Lord with your needs. He wants us to come to him. Why? He's drawn us into a relationship with himself. So he will supply all our needs, maybe not our wants always, but, and he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond, exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we ask or think or imagine. He's able. So he is our source of our resources. Our provider must become our guider. It's not just about having our needs met. If we're, if we're just obsessing on surviving, we need to be focused on what is God's will in my life? What is he calling me to do? Am I way ahead of him or am I running from him? Am I being like Jonah or am I being like Sarah? She got ahead of, Sarah and Abraham got ahead of God's provision by involving Hagar and Ishmael was born. God was going to provide his son for them. Their part was to follow his guidance. So he must, if we want his provision, he must be our guide. He must be our guide. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The context of that verse in 2 Peter 1 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. If that's not letting the Lord be your guide, what is it? He grants to us everything that pertain to life and godliness, following that we are following him and not the things of the world that are all connected to lust. So God is our source. What he provides is our resource. And our provider must become our, guide, our guider. And his guiding leads to our obedience. It's so simple, we miss it. If he's guiding me and I allow him to be guiding me, then I'm going to become obedient. You can have a GPS telling you where to go, but you can ignore it, right? So the GPS is the guide, but what we do with the guidance is a whole nother thing. Now, our fallible GPSs can lead us over a cliff, right? If you have a compass, it always shows, if it's working right, where north is. And you can either follow its guidance to north or follow its guidance to west, east, or just ignore it. Oh, I was wondering where north was. But when it comes to God, he wants to be our guide and he wants us to follow his guidance. Does that make sense? And our obedience leads to his provision. If we'll follow him, if we tell him no just because we don't have the means to take the first step, what are we going to do? 
the Lord told his disciples, feed the multitude, 5,000 men plus women and children. Well, Lord, let's send them away. We don't have any food. Well, what do you have? And placed in the master's hand. A little boy didn't lose his lunch. He went home with more. Look what I got, Mama. Twelve baskets. Abraham was told by God to do a strange thing. Take your son, your only son, to this mountain and offer him to me as a sacrifice. Now this is the miracle boy. This is Isaac. This is the boy they would laugh about when the promise was given because it was so impossible. And they go and tell Sarah, we're going yonder to worship. They leave their helpers behind and just Abraham and Isaac climb this mountain. Isaac carrying the wood on his back. They build the altar. Isaac lays down on the altar. Abraham, no doubt, ties him up, raises the knife to slay him, and the angel of the Lord stops him and says, because you have obeyed me, I'm going to bless you. And shows him the ram in the thicket. Now on the way there, Isaac said, Lord, here's the wood Here's the fire, where is the sacrifice? He didn't know it was going to be him. He didn't know they were going to become a metaphor for the gospel. Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice, which is what happened. A ram, a male lamb, was caught in the thickets by, the, by his horn, by his head, in a thorny bush. And in place of Isaac, they offered the ram to God on the altar and worshiped in that place. And there, God revealed himself to be Jehovah Jireh, or Yehovah Yireh, or Yahweh Yireh. We sing about him, God our provider. But in the revealing of that name, It's clarified by being, as it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, he shall be seen. So the Lord caused Abraham to see his provision because Abraham was obedient to do a strange thing. If he hadn't been obedient, he wouldn't have understood God to be Jehovah Jireh. He would not have seen the provision of the Lord. Now, in response to Abraham's faith, through his covenant, God sent his son to carry wood on his back for a while until he got some help to be offered as a sacrifice on a hill within eyesight of this hill. So on the mount of the Lord, this is the mount of the Lord. It's believed to be the the temple mount, the mount of God, can be seen, Mount Calvary. God's provision. And part of that scenario is Abraham allowed God to be his guide. And in his guidance, he understood God's providence or God providing. And there in that place, the Lord spoke to Abraham. I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now there's two ways to look at this. The Jewish people have been a blessing to the world for centuries in spite of the hatred they receive. You look at a list of the inventions coming out of the land of Israel, it's stunning. It's amazing. But the true prophetic fulfillment of this is some other translations call it seed or seed singular. The seed of Abraham that blesses the nations of the world is the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach who was offered as a sacrifice for us. 
to make a covenant with God for us, hanging as God and man, as the God-man, between heaven and earth, establishing the covenant in himself. So through Abraham's obedience, he got to see the provision of the Lord centuries in advance. Are you tired of living in the dark, not knowing what in the world's going on spiritually, being swayed by all the winds of doctrine out there? Get your eyes on Jesus. Start doing what he's calling you to do. Let's pray as the musicians come forward. Lord, we thank you that you have provided for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Jehovah Jireh. I pray, Lord, that every person in this room would just do a heart check right now. And Lord, may they hear your voice if they're being called to do something and we have held back because of the provision question. Lord, like Moses, who was asked to do an impossible thing, you asked him, what's in your hand? Help us to see what's in our hand and to step out and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord, the Lord calls you into an adventure of following him. He could use you as a missionary or as a pastor or as a bricklayer or as an entrepreneur or as an evangelist to your neighborhood. He could use you in ways you haven't thought of because you begin to follow his guidance. You'll find his providence. Amen.
minute, I'm going to ask for a show of hands that those that would need to prayer in re reference to the message or anything else. And if the Lord is quickening you to pray, don't hold back because you don't know the whole prayer. He'll give you a word, and as you deliver, He'll give you the next one and the next one and the next one. He provides where He guides. So if you're here today and you'd like to receive prayer, could you just raise your hand and hold it up? Just hold your hand up, and we'll have people come to you to pray what the Lord provides through them, a prayer. Would you like to have prayer about anything? Provision, wisdom, healing. I see one hand raised, another hand raised. All right, look around. Say, Lord, are you guiding me? If he is, go. Don't wait for him to provide something. Just go and obey and he will provide. Keep your hand up till someone's by you. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have saved me so much better. 